in the spring of 2002. In Africa, and I wanted them to see that, and I wanted the world to see what was going on in West Africa, but I also wanted him to be humbled before the law, and it worked. But now we still have to get him. It's a political decision now, and I was meeting with the Security Council at that famous round table uh, in May. They all said that we are seized of the Charles Taylor matter. They all stated that he needed to be turned over, some now, some later date. But it's not a matter now of if he should be turned over, but just when. And that's a political decision and outside my hands. Good question. Thank you. I'll get to you. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I'll, pre I'll preface this question in, in that I find when discussing post-World War II war crimes trials, I find uh, opt it's easy to be it's easy to be na naively positive about them. It's also easy to be naively cynical about them. Um, I'll preface that with that. It seems to me that what you're what, what you're concerned about, you, you sort of looked at, at Nuremberg as though it was a bright, shining example of, of the, the rule of law in international affairs. But we still have to keep in mind two things. The first one is that uh, there, there's a lot of things about the Nuremberg trials which were legally and uh, legally sketchy. If, if nothing else, the, the very fact that Stalin and Stalin's uh, agents were, were casting judgment over the Nazis. Were, you know, there's you know, there, there's a general question about you know. Well, you you, you know what the general question is, and and, and the second the second issue has to do with the military tribunal for the Far East. Uh, yeah. Slightly different legal context, slightly different. I mean, very different political situation. But what it seems to me is, is the emperor in that case. Everybody knew he, he bore a good deal of responsibility for the crimes that, that uh, Tojo and the rest of these people were being uh, prosecuted for. And also, it was the, the unsaid thing un, un, in the subtext of the trial was that there's, some, there's, there's a missing person in this room. And it seems to me that if I, if I look at what your concerns are about the uh, international criminal law at a crossroads, and I put it in terms of these aspects of the post-World War II trials, it doesn't look like there's, a, there's any sort of radical crossroads as much as uh, just a continuation of, not a, uh, not a, uh, uh, inherently uh, flawed, but nonetheless a flawed uh, approach to dealing with uh, uh, these types of situations. Well, I think it goes on with the comment that I made related to this lady's uh, point, is, is that there are creatures of political events and political compromise. Uh, we had the same political compromise uh, when they set up the International Tribunal in Sierra Leone. And that is, do we prosecute everyone or do we prosecute those who started, sustained, and kept the conflict going? Because if we prosecute everyone, it would be impossible. Uh, so again, it is intentionally a flawed system because it is part of a political uh, event, and in and of itself, that's flawed. And I'm certainly not going to be standing up here and tell you that the law is not flawed. The law is a creature of human beings. However, it is our only cornerstone, because what's, what's, what's the alternative other than the rule of law, I would ask, and I would posit for you just to be thinking about that. But greatest responsibility was the political compromise in the special court statute. Uh, the United States and other countries would not have backed it if it was most responsible or just responsible, because the difference goes from about 20 defendants, very similar to Nuremberg, to if you say most responsible, it goes to 300, about. Uh, that would have taken my office 20 to 30 years to prosecute. If you say responsible, it goes to 35,000, and that's, again, a very much of an estimate. You have to step back and certainly consider the political ramifications. And so the decision by the chief prosecutor with the discussion and concurrence of a wonderful group of individuals in my office was to who do we prosecute? Knowing full well, because there is no other judicial system in West Africa that could handle that load, that the others would walk away free. Uh, but it's either someone or nothing in a lot of these instances. And I tell you this only because you're right. Uh, there were flaws in, in, in both of the uh, original tribunals. But I would just posit, when mankind stops, hesitates, and in their flawed and fumbling way, try to, in fact, inject the law into or after tragedies such as World War II or the 10-year Civil War in, uh, 
in Sierra Leone or the tragedies in Rwanda and Yugoslavia. That's all we can do. And uh, yes, you're very correct, sir. I don't, don't dispute your point. But you do have to sometimes step back and altruistically think of the fact that we've done something. As flawed as it may be, we have done something uh, so that the people can seek some type of justice. I'll give you an example. When you go into the courtroom in Sierra Leone, I won't speak of individual cases nor individual defendants. I cannot do that. But when you, the courtroom is just outside my office. And when you drive in in the morning with all my protection details and all that stuff, it's quite a, quite a show. I pull in, I go to my office, and I open, open my curtain screens and stuff, and I watch the people of Sierra Leone lined up to go to their court that was built for them and actually by them. Uh, that in and of itself is moving. They're, they're, they're in wheelchairs. Uh, some of them can't walk because their, uh, their limbs are amputated what have you, but they're showing up every day to watch justice being done. Is that altruistic? Yes, it is. Is, is that what the law is all about? Yes, it is. And I tell you that because in this modern world where we tend to be cynical, uh, I've had the privilege of actually seeing the law, such as Mr. Professor Harris, change things. I mean, in front of your eyes, watch the law change an entire region of the world. That is a, a special privilege which I have been given as with Professor Harris and Professor King and, of course, Robert Jackson. But I tell you that, and I, I belittle the point, only because you just have to remember that, that the law can change lives and the law can change whole regions of the world. As small and as flawed as it may be, it is a step in the right direction. When I would travel around the country, literally standing in front of my client, the 5.4 million people of Sierra Leone, in town hall meetings, very similar to like they used to have here and, and this part of the, of the country. And it was exactly the reason. I, I wanted to hear what they had to say about the court, about law, about justice, and what took place here. And it was really a humbling experience listening to them tell me what took place and answer their questions about the law, what it, could be, what, what it can do for them, what have you, because they had no trust in the law. But I left them with three things, that the law is fair, no one is above the law, and the rule of law is more powerful than the AK-47, which can be purchased on the streets of Sierra Leone cheaper than a pack of Western cigarettes, a brand new, fully loaded AK-47, which is a horrific, horrific weapon. So life is cheap, uh, and life is very cheap in parts of the world that, uh, that, uh, that uh, I had the, uh, the privilege of actually living in and trying to do some small work. I apologize for going off on a tangent, but uh, you pushed a button. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You spoke of a concern for the uh, African exception, the Nuremberg principle. Yes, ma'am. You include truth commissions in this African exception, and uh, you find them problematic. And can you also speak about the relationship of the special court to the truth commission in Sierra Leone and some of the problems you well, thank you for that, and I, I, I preface that as uh, we didn't have many problems with the Truth Commission, actually. Uh, uh, there was a lot of debate, a lot of discussion. I read a lot of those materials before I went over to West Africa in August of 2002. And, the, and the, really the question was, can, can, you, can you have a Truth Commission, which was not at Nuremberg, and a war crimes tribunal operating at the same time? That, there was, everyone hesitated. Now, of course, the South African model uh, of the Truth Commission uh, was an incredible, uh, flaw to it may have been, was a step in the right direction. But it had never been done before where you had a tribunal and a Truth and Reconciliation Commission operating at the same time. Most of it unintentionally. It was great debated whether we should hold the special court, the International Tribunal, to come in after the Truth Commission did its work or vice versa. It was just happenstance that it just all happened at the same time. So I, with great deal of thought, I stepped off the airplane within a week. I held a press conference with the press there. There's not much, but I did. And I said, um, I am not going to use anything, any information, any evidence that goes before the Truth Commission, publicly or privately, in my investigations against those who bear the greatest responsibility. I felt that in order to build a criminal case, if I was using their evidence, I was in trouble. Uh, and that I urged the people of Sierra Leone, and I did this throughout the town hall meetings for three years, urged them to, uh, to support the TRC. In fact, I was the TRC's greatest fan. 
Uh, and it was a great, great moment in 2nd of December of 2002 when Bishop Joseph Humphrey, who was the chairman of the TRC and I, on Human Rights Day uh, in Sierra Leone, uh, attended a public ceremony, and then we both spoke, and we turned to each other and shook hands and said we're going to work together. Now, again, it didn't work perfectly, but it's, again, uh, it's a human-based system. However, for 18 months, in my opinion, humble opinion, uh, the Truth, and Truth Commission and my investigators worked, to work side by side sometimes in trying to seek the justice that was needed. Because in my mind, in those situations, in uh, societies that are transitioning from war to peace, you have to both have the truth as well as justice, and then you have a more sustainable peace. If one of those are missing, you may have what appears to be a peace, but I would posit to you that it is not a sustainable peace. The Truth Commission is, in my mind, in these situations, probably more appropriate than just a tribunal. The truth will be had in a tribunal, but it's a focused truth. What did these defendants do? When did they do it? And did it raise to a level beyond a reasonable doubt that it manifests itself into some type of international crime? That is a very narrow truth-telling. Truth will be told on the record. Uh, but again, that is not what the truth I'm speaking of. The truth is, is the people of West Africa and Sierra Leone having the opportunity to tell their story. One thing that was driven home to me a great deal is after I would, or I'd be to listening to people, they would literally come up to me and pull on my sleeve or my, my arm and say, I want you to hear what happened to me or my family or my village. Now, as a chief prosecutor of an international war crimes tribunal, I am interested in their stories, but I can't prosecute every crime, every tragedy. So what do you do to allow them to step forward and officially, if they so choose, tell their story? Well, that is through a truth commission. And I call it the great safety valve. And so I would say, look, I'm going to seek justice for you. I may not be able to prosecute the individual that cut your wife down in front of you, but I will, do, I will prosecute those who created the conditions that allow that to happen. However, if you want to tell your story about what happened to your family, then I would urge you to go to the Truth Commission. And they did by the tens of thousands. So it wasn't perfect, no. We had our controversies from time to time, uh, one of which is very obvious, and I won't speak of it in this form. But again, that was a professional disagreement. Every organization and, uh, has professional disagreements as to whether we should allow someone to testify versus not. But again, that was handed over to the judicial process under our administrative rules, and it was judicially determined. But I'm just telling you that I think, looking back now, after 36 months in West Africa, uh, you can have a truth commission, and you can have an international tribunal, and they can work together to help build a, a sustainable peace. Now, they're not the be-all to end-all. But certainly it assists an overall effort of trying to bring a country back from the brink. I'm going to stop this right now. Uh, just in order to keep this guy there, but we can go forever, David. David will be around. He's going to be around for a few minutes. And I might add that he made some extra efforts to get her. He had a class last night, got up early this morning, drove in from Syracuse just to be part of this today. And he, he, I can't thank you enough, David Crane. So thank you. Thank you.